Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the France Country Series. After having a look at the Seven Years War, we're now taking a look at the French Revolution by Oversimplified. This is a two-part video, so I'm just gonna be looking at part one today. And to say that this is one of the most important events in human history, yeah, really is almost understating it. The French Revolution had extremely wide-ranging effects, not only on Europe, but as well as in North America and as well as in Asia too. This was really the sort of turning point of the century into what is more or less the modern age that we live in. While not the exact event that you could say really ushered in this new era of modernity, it's an incredibly important event, and it's one that I do know a little bit more about on, whereas some of the other stuff we've covered in the country series yet, it was totally new to me. So I'll be providing a few comments here and there, as is usual. And I'm super happy to check this video out. I've never seen it before. So without further ado, if you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Let's get into it. So I said to the Marquis de la Fufayette, what do you think I am? Some dirty peasant? I've never worked a day in my life. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that Marie Antoinette sure is pretty. Sure is. Wouldn't want to be Prince Louis though. That's going to be a lot of responsibility when he <laughs> becomes king, especially since France is in financial ruin. Quite. Thank you one and all for attending the royal marriage of my grandson. Exactly. And so France at this point, right after having lost the Seven Years' War, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go check that video out. Just did a reaction video to that one. Um, France is in a very, very, very bad state in terms of poor financial management, all sorts of issues with taxes where certain parts of the country are being taxed more than others. The collection of it was very poor. It would target uh, poorer people more than it would the rich people. The rich people were incredibly weak to reform. They didn't want to change anything. And it just spiraled out of control, where unlike in England at this time, where Parliament actually had power, France was still an absolute monarchy. And there's a lot of actual comparisons here between the French Revolution and what would happen in Russia for Tsar Nicholas II's fall, um, about a, how many years later? About 130 years later. And so it's, it's yeah, to say that France was uh, in ruin, it might even be putting it lightly. And uh, Marie Antoinette, by the way, is, is, is an Austrian. Uh, she was not originally supposed to marry Louis, but ended up doing it anyways. And she was, I think she was pretty much hated by the court, um, sort of seen as an outsider and not a true, you know, French woman, French man. The future French king person. of France to the Archduchess of Austria. Now for the very awkward yet historically accurate part of the ceremony, where we all watch them get into bed together. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now that's out of the way. Let's lead the royal couple to it. You better give us an air, you fat, ill-bred boy. Nighty night. That's going to be a lot of responsibility. France is in financial ruin. You fat, ill-bred boy. Quite. That's going to be a lot of responsibility. France is in financial ruin. Oh, great. He's a freaking weirdo. <laughs> nice. France, the most prosperous, cultured, and beautiful nation in the world as Oof, it had been for liquor. centuries. An exquisite social culture, with the king and the upper classes throwing crazy parties every night, enjoying high living and fine dining. Who cares that they were only able to do so off the backs of the hard-working, starving poor? What are they going to do? Revolt? They're only 80% of the population. No. Life in France is great. What's that, friend? Yeah, and so this is what I was talking about where you see some of the parallels with uh, Nicholas II. I think the Rev Russian Revolution video pretty much started in the same way where you have the incredibly rich and incredibly powerful people at the top really living off the, the, the backs of the other 80%, 90%, whatever it is. And though that this system would obviously come to collapse, spoiler alert, the French Revolution, but, you know, this system really can only work so long in a society and the extreme income inequality that was uh, present in France and that we're still, I mean, we're still talking about income inequality to this day. It's still a prevalent issue. You know, that really is sort of a sign of the healthiness, if you will, of a nation. You want to go to war with Britain and increase your power? Go for it, little buddy. You do you. 
And you lost. Now okay, you're in go check out financial that video. debt. We have no money. What do we do? Should we stop partying? Heck no. Party harder. That's okay. The peasantry will pick up the slack. They were created by God to do all the work, and you were created to reap all the benefits and party hard. That's just how society works, and we've all just accepted it for centuries. Why? Why what? Why do the nobility get to be all rich and stuff? Just because they were born into it? And the rest of us schmucks just have to accept that? Hell, why do we even need a king? Who decided that? It all just seems very unfair and unequal. And I, for one, am starting to question it. You're wasting all that wow. beer. That's very enlightened of you. And so began the Age of Enlightenment. Great philosophical thinkers across France and beyond began to question whether this beautiful nation was really all that beautiful after all. Hey, Prince Louis, bad news. Your grandpa died of smallpox this morning, which means good news, you're now the king. So just to sum up, France is in severe financial debt and the angry populace are beginning to question how necessary you are. But hey, I believe in you, champ. You got this. Maybe. He doesn't know. Yeah, and so Louis is like, I think he's like 20, maybe he's 20, he's between 20 and 25 at this age, where now he's inherited a country that at this point really needs a strong ruler. And I don't mean that by being as authoritarian as possible, but someone who really has strong leadership qualities. And Louis just doesn't have that. He's very indecisive. He's back and forth on a lot of things. And he's just not the leader that France needs at this time. France would get a leader, certainly of strong leadership qualities uh, after him, but I'll get into that series next. Prince Louis Capet became King Louis XVI in May 1774. He was a notoriously weak man, and he knew yeah. it. He barely had the wisdom to rule a nation, never mind one in crisis, and he was easily manipulated by those around him. Again, see the parallels here with Tsar Nicholas II, right? I, I think he even used the same graph. One of his first acts was to try to get revenge on the British by financing their American colonies' revolution. Hey, we're an independent nation now. That was real swell of you, Louis. Couldn't have done it without you. Glad I could help. So hey, about all that money we lent you, nope. when can we get that back? Not yep, a thing. You're a great guy. I'll never forget what you've done for us. Real glad I could help, friend, but about that money. You gotta go now, chum. Best of luck to you. Oh, no. <laughs> and now France yeah, was America gave him nothing. Dead. France is poor, suffering under the strain of economic ruin, watched as the nobility continued to live as though nothing was wrong. In particular, they grew increasingly disdainful of the queen, Marie Antoinette, as she continued to spend all of France's money on her own luxurious lifestyle and fashion. While the peasants were breaking their backs in the fields, she was walking around like, hey, my hair is a boat. I'm not making that up. Her hair really was a boat. And her lavish spending earned okay. her the nickname Madame Deficit. And speaking of the queen, there was also a long-standing scandal around the fact that the king took a very long time to boink her. And the working classes of Paris <laughs> began ridiculing the royal couple with lewd pamphlets depicting the queen as a court thought and the king is a wuss, unable to fulfill his marital duty. Respect for the monarchy was at an <laughs> okay. all-time low. As French, It's good to know that some things never change. Finances uh. were spiraling out of control, and the king and his aides really only had one solution to the crisis. Tax the poor. Tax the poor. We could do a sexy calendar shoot. Uh, I mean, tax the poor. And so... And I mean, that's... Yes, that is eventually what did happen. And that's, you know, one of the main causes of the revolution. But it's also important to note that King Louis had wanted to tax the nobility. But because the nobility was so really conservative in their way, and I don't mean like big C conservative, I just mean really traditionalist and wanting to stick um, to the system that they had. They were not reformist in any way. And with King Louis being so indecisive and pretty weak, the nobility were basically just able to override him on everything. And there was no reforms that were actually made. So it wasn't that the answer was immediately, oh, let's just keep taxing the poor. It's just that the reforms that the king tried to bring in were never going to pass through the France's nobility at this time, who were arguably pretty decadent, to use a what if all this term. So it was. The poor, who were already struggling to make ends meet, found themselves being taxed from every direction. Hey, I'm the royal tax collector. Looks like you've yet to pay your income tax, head tax. By the way, how many windows you got in that house of yours? Um, three? Oof, yep, there's gonna be a tax for that. Hey, your local priest here. Have you paid your church tithe yet? Well, at least this one is going to the good work of God. Sure. God. I think this year, God wants me to buy a new swimming pool. 
Hey, private tax collector here. Oh, and I brought some goons with me. Just a few quick questions. How much salt did you buy this year? About seven kilos, I think? Yep. Okay, there's gonna be a tax for that. Oh, what's that over there? And that's extra salt I held over from last year, so I wouldn't have to buy as much this year. Oh, yep, there's a tax for that. Um, and what are you doing with all of this salt? Well, obviously cooking. Mm-hmm. On the table. Yep. And preserving fish and meat. Oh, oh there's no. gonna be a tax yep. for that. And there's a tax for that. There you hey, go. how old is he? He's nine. And so he's purchased his required amount of salt for this year, right? What? No, he's nine. Uh-oh. Sorry, little Timmy. Looks like I'm gonna have to tax you for that. Yep. Salty. There's gonna be a tax for that. And that's not all. A huge portion of the peasants' harvest had to be given up. And there was also the labor tax, where peasants were required to work a certain number of days for their local lord without pay. Obviously, yep. people weren't too happy with these taxation policies. And the aggressive nature of these private tax farmers sometimes even escalated to violence. In particular, though, the people really hated how inconsistent the taxation rules were across the nation. Exactly. And this is because the, the parliaments, so... Britain obviously has Parliament itself, capital P Parliament, but there are also so smaller sort of, I guess you would sort of call them municipal governments, that France has this point, and it doesn't have that overarching parliamentary figure, it just has Louis itself because it's an authoritarian monarchist uh, country, right? And so because all these local governments are able basically to sort of set their own taxes, if you will, again, I'm grandly oversimplifying this, um, you have all this really confusing ways of doing it as well as all these places they didn't all collect taxes the same and some of the taxes that were uh, levied on the on the second um, what would you say the second class right they were not collected as efficiently as they were on the third class or anything like this and also the fact that the first two estates often had to and pay estate, very little that's what I was if any for. tax at all and yeah. so the anger continued to grow France had a population that was just about ready to explode. What could push them over the edge? How about a touch of natural disaster? Mm. A series of harsh summers and winters left the peasants' harvests in ruin, meaning they had no food or money, and the cost of bread skyrocketed. Of course, <laughs> the upper classes had massive stocks of grain and wheat, so they were virtually Random untouched portrait by of Frederick the Great. Okay. But now the poor really were starving, and they began to riot. Women took to the streets. Bakeries were raided, and bakers, suspected of keeping bread for themselves, were sometimes even hanged. Wow, this is really getting out of control. Your Majesty, we need some decisive action. You need to step up and lead us. What will you do? Okay, okay, I've got this. I know. I'll summon the Estates General, and they'll decide what to do. You really are a fat, ill-bred boy. The yep. Estates General was the closest thing France had to a government apart from the king. It was a purely advisory body and was rarely summoned. In fact, it hadn't been summoned for 175 years prior to this. But with France in a severe crisis... Yeah, you heard that right. So the Estate General is, again, we're going on the Tsar Nicholas par uh, parallels here. Similar to the Duma, right, which was the, the Russian sort of advisory body for the, for the Tsar. This, is, this was just an advisory body. They had no power. Unlike parliaments, you know, they had absolutely no power. They were just to advise the king, but ultimately the king had the final say in everything. The fact that it wasn't adjourned, or sorry, the fact that it wasn't, um, you know, there was, there was no sessions for more than a hundred years. And then to just pull this thing out of nowhere to call, you know, to try and fix the situation. It's just, you, you got to imagine if you're a French... If you're a French worker, you know, living in Paris or whatever at this time, um, you know, and you own a textile shop or, or a sewing shop, whatever, and then you hear that, you know, they're just recalling this parliament now after it hasn't been called in hundreds of years. Ugh, ridiculous. Racist. Over 100 years, should I say. The king felt the time was right to call on the government to help. The Estates General was made up of representatives from the three estates, that is, the clergy, the nobility, and everybody else. Yep. Okay, thanks for coming, everyone. The first order of business is regarding the clergy and nobility. You all get brand new Porsches. You get a Porsche. And you get a Porsche. And you get a Porsche. Everybody gets a Porsche. A Porsche or Porsche. And now into the second order of business. France is completely out of money. Like, it's never been this bad before. Anyone got any ideas? How about we all get Lamborghinis next time? <laughs> the king decided that in order to make a decision, they had to come up with a voting system. 
Okay, the clergy. You have a population of 130,000, so you'll get one vote. The nobility. You have a population of 350,000, so you'll also get one vote. one vote. And the third estate. You have a population of 27 million people and make up 98% of the population. Very impressive. You'll get one vote. One vote. The third estate were obviously pretty unhappy yeah. with this system because they kept on finding that this would happen. We propose to raise taxes on the third estate. All in favor? All opposed? <laughs> two to one. Taxes will be raised on the third estate. We propose a motion that says the first two estates are a bunch of poo poo heads. All in favor? All opposed? Two to one. It's official. We are not poo poo heads. <laughs> <laughs> the third estate reelect. Right, so you can only imagine this too. You know, it, it's basically tyranny by a minority rule, you know, if you will. Um, yeah, just a ridiculous system. Is that any attempt at reform would be outvoted by the two upper estates. And they thought that was kind of lame. So they decided that since they were 98% of the population, they could go off to form their own government, make their own laws, and take over the running of the country. And so, the National Assembly was born. The third estate was now in control, and there was nothing the king could do to stop- Ha ha! I've locked you all out of your building! What are you gonna do about it? We'll probably go find a different building yep. that isn't locked. Ow, no! The National Assembly did find another unlocked building, just down the road, an indoor tennis court. Where on the 20th of June, 1789, they all took the tennis court oath, Pretty pledging cool. to continue meeting until the king finally gave into their demands for more equality and economic reform. This new National Assembly included many of the most educated members of the Third Estate, including two young lawyers by the names of yep. Maximilian Robespierre. We'll and hear more about Benton. him soon. Some members of the first two estates even joined their cause. Some of these men formed a radical new political party called the Jacobin Club and quickly became leading figures. While many members of the Third Estate simply wanted more equality, a growing number in this Jacobin faction would begin calling for something even crazier, the removal of the king entirely. And this is where fear began to take hold. With such a volatile situation developing, everyone was afraid of something. The king feared his position was under threat, and he called in the military to take position around Paris. The third estate heard... And again, so this is... Yeah, again, just the parallels, the parallels here, right? When you call in the military and you have people that are protesting against you there's this culture of fear what do you think is going to happen you're basically lighting a powder keg in your own city Oof, yeah the more uh you know the more that i've been doing these videos and the more i've been reading about certain events and learning about how different governments functioned it always repeats itself doesn't it it always repeats itself i'm sure that you can list you know three other examples where something like this similar happened and uh yeah it didn't turn out for the best. Rumor of the gathering military force, and they feared the king was planning to round them up and arrest them. See? Maybe he'd even execute them. Exactly. It also didn't help that the king had just dismissed France's popular finance minister, who had been trying to make reforms himself. It seemed the king was done negotiating. Fear, left unchecked, often boils over into anger, and anger detonates with violence. Yep. The angry people of Paris, after centuries of cruel inequality, harsh oppression, even starvation, fearful of having their new movement for reform demolished so soon, decided that it was now or never to take action. Screw reform. They decided they'd do one better. How about revolution? Mm -hmm. The people of Paris, believing the French military was preparing to attack, decided they should arm themselves. The National Assembly announced the creation of a bourgeois militia, the National Guard, and immediately many troops from the French military defected over to the revolutionary side. In the early hours of July 14th, 1789, a large crowd stormed and raided yep. the Hotel de Invalides, a military hospital where they were able to secure a large number of rifles. But no the bad news powder. was they weren't able to find any gunpowder for yes. their new weapons. So they had to go the to good Castillo. news was they knew exactly where to get some. Yep. A prison fortress and a symbol of royal tyranny towering over Paris, the Bastille. Mid-morning, the crowd gathered around the Bastille and demanded that the man in charge, Governor Delaunay, surrender oh. the prison and yeah. hand over the gunpowder. This is going to be a bad fate for him. Obviously, Governor Delaunay was like, no way. So he stalled for time by inviting a few members of the crowd in for negotiations. The crowd, still waiting outside, quickly became impatient. And before long, they stormed the fortress, taking on the French troops inside. Your Majesty, we've received word that the people have surrounded the Bastille. Governor Delaunay will hold them off. No need to worry. Actually, your majesty, 
It appears the crowd is now headed away from the Bastille. You see? What did I tell you? Clearly, Governor Delaunay has defeated them and has them on the run. Yeah, about no that. need to worry. Uh, Your Majesty, isn't that Governor Delaunay's head on a pike? Well, yeah. clearly, Governor Delaunay has taken on the form of a bodiless pikehead deity, and the people are so enamored with him, they're parading him around the city. No need to worry at all. When the National <laughs> Assembly heard about the violence that had taken place, they had two options. Either one, they denounce it and try to carry on the revolution using peaceful means, or yeah. two, they say, damn. You stuck his head on a pike? That's pretty hardcore. And we love it. Incidentally, they went with option number two. Some historians believe this reaction paved the way for the utter violence and bloodshed that would become the legacy of the French Revolution. This widespread acceptance of violence during the revolution yeah. is also largely credited to the writings of a certain Jean. For sure. And and that's one thing too, is that violence begets more violence, right? It's, it's always that tipping point where if you have the leaders of this revolution that are openly accepting violence and openly advocating for violence, what do you think is going to happen? When you have all the chaos that's going on at this point, the French Revolution becomes incredibly bloody and incredibly terrifying for many people that live underneath it. And yeah. Yeah. I, whether there's a peaceful way to do a revolution, one that I can think of is the Velvet Revolution that happened in Czechoslovakia. But it is a shame that something that has such good intentions gets spoiled by the by the inherently violent nature of humanity if you will paul marat a man of science with a horrible skin condition that kept him confined to a bathtub he began writing a radical newspaper he affectionately named the friend of the people citizens of france be very afraid given the chance the king and the nobility won't hesitate to massacre us all mm -hmm. the solution is simple Execute them. Kill every last one of them. See cut off I mean? a thousand heads. And if that's not enough, cut off a thousand more. Oh, hey, Mr. Squeaky. What are you doing down there? You're so cute. Oh, I love you too, Mr. Squeaky. Mwah. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Kill them all. It became one of the most popular publications <laughs> yeah. in Paris during the revolution and succeeded in spreading ever-increasing fear and anger among the people. In August, leaders of the National Assembly, with help from a certain Thomas Jefferson, adopted the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, an incredible document that guaranteed liberty and equal rights yep. to all men. And when I say men, I mean men. Mm -hmm. Despite its glaring shortcomings in gender equality, the massively influential declaration would go on to inspire the struggle for liberty and equality across the planet for centuries. However, back in France, the- You gotta think too, so with Jefferson being here at this point, that must have had a massive effect on Thomas Jefferson himself. Now, I don't know too much about him specifically, um, but you got to think that if he's here during the revolution and all these events are happening, what sort of influence that had on him when he would eventually go and become president, right? When he comes back here, I think he's the, fir he's the first... He's the first Secretary of State, yes. So he comes, becomes the first Secretary of State under George Washington and then later would become president. And so, yeah, I, I wonder how much probably it must have had a massive effect on Thomas Jefferson being here during this time and helping craft that document. Vast majority of the people weren't really so concerned with enlightened ideas of equality as much as they were concerned with the fact that they were still starving. Bread was still expensive as hell and hard to come by. The people felt that one reason nothing had been done yet about the crisis was because the king simply couldn't see the problem. He lived in Versailles a full 20 kilometers southwest of Paris, and as a result, lived in comfort, separated from his dirty, stinking subjects. On October 5th, a crowd of women, 7,000 strong, decided they'd do something unprecedented. They decided they'd remove that separation and confront the king directly. The women marched all the way to the king's palace in Versailles. Along the way, the crowd continued to grow into the tens of thousands, and when they arrived, they demanded an audience with the king. What are those things outside the palace? They're poor people, your majesty. <laughs> That's poor people? They say they're hungry. Hungry? Then let them eat cake. Wow. See, this is the exact BS that led to this whole mess in the first place. You're so out of touch. They're writhing around in the filth, breaking their back to barely scrape by, and they come to you demanding just the basic ability to feed themselves, and you think a slice of cake will sort them out? Well? Then let them eat Taco Bell Crunchwrap Supreme. Wow. 
They're not that desperate. Members of the crowd. <laughs> yeah, and so whether Mary Antoinette actually did say that is sort of up for debate. I don't think there's any, there's been every any sort of source that has proven that, but makes for a pretty good saying, I can't lie. Actually managed to break into the palace with the intention of killing the queen, who narrowly escaped through a secret passage in her bedroom. The enraged mob killed several members of the royal guard and raised their heads on pikes, which if you haven't noticed yet, is something they were quite fond of doing. It's becoming the a king thing. had no choice but to come out and talk to the crowd. He agreed to accept his new position, sharing power with the revolutionary government, and to return to Paris with the crowd, removing the separation between king and subject. King Louis had a problem with people constantly raiding his palace, but one thing he didn't have a problem with was people raiding his computer. Oh, because... Wait, is that is that the end of that one? NordVPN? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so that's it for me. Thank you all very much for joining me on this one. This is just a fascinating story. One of the most important events out there. Part two, always looking forward to that. I love, yeah, oversimplified's fantastic, isn't he? Thank you all again for joining me. Take care. If you haven't already checked out the France Country series, there's a playlist at the beginning. Go check it out from there. Glad you guys are with me on this journey. See you in the next video.